the four elements of a leak. It might seem silly to have a conversation about what really constitutes leak. Everyone already knows what a leak is, right? It's water where we don't want it. But architecturally, it really helps to take a more thorough and disciplined approach to the topic. First, it helps for us to remember that in designing buildings, we're not engaged in a water blocking project. We're designing for water management. This is very hard for a lot of people to accept, and it's really the difference in how professionals approach water control and building design and how lay people understand it. It helps to keep this in mind because a lot of people that we deal with, including a lot of our clients, really are under the impression that buildings are intended to entirely block water. The reality is that for water infiltration to be problematic, the wetting a wall or a roof experiences must exceed its capacity to store and redistribute water for long enough to damage the materials that compose it. This is an unbelievably important concept. It is fundamental to building design. We're really dealing with a rate storage question. What is the rate of wetting? What is the rate of drying? And what is the safe storage capacity of the components? How wet can they get before they rot or corrode or start smelling bad? These questions are obviously highly contextual. Where are we building? Is this Houston or Chicago or Las Vegas? And what are we building with? Solid masonry assemblies have a much higher capacity to safely store water than a two by six cavity insulated framed wall with OSB sheathing and paper face drywall. With that in mind, let's talk specifically about leaks. For a leak to occur, the following four things need to happen, and we need all four. The first is we need a source of water, and this is pretty obvious. We also need a pathway for that water to travel from where it is to where we don't want it to be. Then we need a driving force to push water along that pathway. And finally, we need something to be damaged as a result or for someone to be annoyed. The reason thinking about leaks in this way is so helpful is because it reveals some opportunities that we often overlook when it comes to water management. When talking about leaks and avoiding them, we focus almost all of our attention on that second item, the pathways. We obsess over sealing pathways through our buildings. And that's not wrong, but it is incomplete. And it's often just ineffective. The truth is that we have more design tools at our disposal than we might first imagine. So what are they? Let's revisit our list. We can practice source control, we can seal the pathways that we can seal. We're usually not able to seal all of our pathways, we'll get to that, but we can seal the big ones. We can reduce the driving forces, we'll get to that too. And we can minimize the use of moisture sensitive materials, or we might be able to minimize the use of moisture sensitive materials. Let's talk about each of these elements and the design response to them in more specific and practical terms. First, source control. The sources we're dealing with are rain and groundwater. We can design our buildings in such a way as to minimize the water load. And it is appropriate to think of water as a load, just like structure, but to minimize the water load on the most critical or sensitive parts of the building. For example, with roof overhangs, cornices, recessed windows, setbacks, I think it's easy for us to dismiss how important this element of design is. Like, yeah, 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 we know that roof overhangs are good, but no, 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 they're really good. Uh, I'm pretty into this stuff myself, and I was pretty shocked to look into the measured data on the effectiveness of source control. So for example, did you know that pitching your roof and providing a modest overhang reduces rain deposition on walls by about 50%? That's a really big deal. And that'll really take the edge off in the event that you're not perfect about dealing with the rest of the things on our list. Next, we need to deal with the pathways. What are the most common pathways? We've got building joints, transitions, and penetrations. With respect to penetrations, we've got the large obvious ones like windows, doors, and service penetrations, um, like electrical conduits, plumbing penetrations, that kind of thing. But we also have a ton of smaller penetrations like fasteners. And we have a lot of fasteners and each one is a pathway for water. We've got fasteners that hold the sheathing in place, fasteners that hold the water control membrane in place, and fasteners that hold the cladding in place. 
We can seal some of these, but we couldn't seal all of them even if we wanted to. A lot of times we have blind fasteners through our cladding that we can't access to seal. It turns out this really isn't a big deal. In fact, our buildings routinely have thousands of unsealed fasteners. And the reason this works is because A, not enough water reaches them in the first place due to source control. Our, our cladding does a pretty good job of shedding most of the water before it even reaches those pathways. And B, there is no driving force pushing water through those pathways. Let's talk about that. What are the common driving forces acting on our buildings? What are the things that can push water from one place to another? We have gravity, hydrostatic pressure, wind, momentum, capillarity, and surface tension. Some of these driving forces are pretty obvious. If we've got a low slope, flat roof, and we have a hole in it, the driving force that will push water along that pathway into the building is gravity, right? But what about some of the other less obvious driving forces? Surface tension describes the tendency of water to stick to a surface. The most common architectural example of surface tension is water tracking back horizontally along a soffit or some architectural detail rather than dripping down because of gravity. This tends to be most relevant to us in seeking to minimize staining, not really in preventing leaks. Capillary action is the movement of water within the confined space of a porous material due to the attractive force of surface tension. Capillary action is actually, maybe surprisingly, a form of surface tension, but it's surface tension within a small space. Now, a practical example is dipping a paper towel into a cup of water and watching the water wick through the, the paper towel. The same thing happens with all kinds of building materials, particularly cementitious building materials like brick, stucco, concrete, and mortar. Now, incidentally, it's also what brings water up to the leaves of trees. Water from the ground will wick up through the roots and the trunk and all the branches, all the way to the leaves at the very tops of trees. And thinking of trees is actually quite helpful because not only do we build with wood, we also intuitively know that trees can be very tall, which is a powerful indication of the magnitude of capillary transfer. Hydrostatic pressure is another extremely important transport mechanism for liquid water. And it's important enough to merit its own video, so we're just gonna be brief here. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that water exerts against a surface when it's held up against that surface. The most classic example of that is a lake and a dam. This is a photo of Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam. We know intuitively that the water in the lake exerts a force, a pressure, on the dam, and we know that the pressure it exerts at the bottom of the dam will be much greater than the pressure it exerts at the top of the dam. What's less intuitive is that the pressure the water exerts on the dam is entirely a function of height how much water is above us expressed vertically. So in other words, the volume of the lake is not actually relevant, but the depth is, which is pretty wild. It's actually the case that the pressure that Lake Mead exerts on the Hoover Dam one inch below the surface is the same as the pressure that one inch of water will exert on your glass of water one inch below the surface, which is pretty crazy, right? But it is true. Anyway, even though the volume of water isn't relevant to the pressure, it's obviously relevant to us in building design. We could have a very high driving force pushing water into the building, say a really high wind, for example. But if that wind is occurring and it's not also raining, or if it's maybe only a light rain, that's not nearly as bad as the same high wind causing a, a great pressure during a heavy rain. So these are some of the common driving forces that will push water along our pathways and into our buildings. But let's finish going through this list. What are the most common materials at risk of damage? Basically anything moisture sensitive, especially wood-based sheathings like plywood and OSB, trim, flooring, insulations, paper face gypsum, that kind of stuff. Sometimes we can replace some of these with non-moisture sensitive or less moisture sensitive alternatives, but oftentimes we, we just can't. Let's now take a look at a practical example of all of these things working together. 
This is a standard residential wall with a brick veneer and a typical WRB behind it. I'd like us to go through each of the four elements of a leak to see if we have a problem and what the potential remedies are. We want to identify sources, pathways, driving forces, and materials at risk of damage. So take a look at the wall. Do we have a source of water? Well, it's not in the photo, but yeah, rain, right? What about pathways? Are there any pathways for water to get from the exterior into the wall assembly itself and then into the interior? And sure, there are lots of penetrations through this wall. Even if we set aside windows and service penetrations and think only about the field of the wall, we've got the fasteners that hold the sheathing in place, the fasteners that hold the water control membrane in place, which is uh, Tyvek in this example. We also have the fasteners that hold the brick ties in place. Not, not uh, visible in this image, but, um, but those will have fasteners too. All of these are behind the brick though. Are there pathways for water to get behind the brick? And the answer is yes. Water can pass through the pores and capillaries of both the brick and the mortar. So we have lots of pathways, but do we have any driving forces pushing water along those pathways? The answer here is yes as well, right? We have wind, we have capillary pressures to get water behind that brick, and we have hydrostatic pressure. Usually there's a gap between a brick veneer and the sheathing and WRB behind it. And that's the case here too. We have about a one inch gap between the two. If that gap were clear, if it were empty, which of course is how it's always shown on the drawings, we'd be fine. But it's not clear here, is it? We've got mortar droppings in that gap. And what do the mortar droppings do? Not only does the mortar itself facilitate additional capillary transfer, but the mortar droppings also allow water to become perched against the sheathing. And the more water that accumulates, the greater the pressure driving that water to the interior, just like a dam. Okay, so we've got a source of water, we've got lots of pathways, and we've got driving forces. Do we have anything that can be damaged? Yes, we do. We don't see the rest of the wall behind the WRB in this photo, but we can presume that there's plywood or OSB sheathing, fiberglass bat insulation in the wall cavity, and drywall on the interior, all of which are moisture sensitive. So is this wall going to leak? Yes. Now, what's the easiest thing that we could have done with the least effort to avoid this? we could have kept that cavity behind the brick veneer clear of mortar droppings. A clear space for drainage means we remove the hydrostatic pressure and that clear air space also breaks up the capillary flow through the brick and the mortar. Deal with the driving forces and the pathways become less important. There are no commercially available WRBs that are self-sealing enough to resist hydrostatic pressure. Now, practically speaking, it can be pretty hard to actually provide a gap in residential construction with brick where there's only a one inch gap behind the brick. It's nearly impossible for a mason to keep mortar droppings out of such a small space. In commercial construction, the convention is to have two inches behind the brick, and that's much easier to keep clear. But in residential construction with such a small gap, I recommend using a drainage mat or at a minimum, a second layer of building paper to act as a spacer to preserve at least a little bit of the wall's capacity to drain. But let's get back to the big picture. I'm not telling you you shouldn't seal the pathways for water in your wall assemblies. I'm telling you that from a water management perspective, sealing the pathways by itself is not the most effective strategy. I'm telling you to think holistically about water management. And that means practicing source control, doing the best you can with the pathways, reducing the driving forces, and minimizing the use of moisture sensitive materials.